If you look at NVIDIA, what the FOMO around NVIDIA is not necessarily the price breakout, but the narrative. I get it. It's going to be the biggest thing since the internet, maybe bigger than the internet. That's how you got to get people into the crypto space. Not just talking about whether or not we're going to make you get to 100,000 and FOMO in everybody after that, but what does it do? What do we do with it other than custody it and wait for the price to go up? Welcome to Bankless, where today we're exploring the reason why stocks are up and crypto is down or flat. This is not the bull market we were promised. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I've got a solo episode for you guys today. David's out at ETCC and he's climbing mountains. So I am here to help you become more bankless. That's the question for today. Why are stocks up but crypto isn't? We have macro investor Jim Bianco on the podcast today. And whenever I'm trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense to me in macro and the broader uh, finance world, Jim is just the perfect guest to ask. So I brought him on. I had a handful of questions that were top of mind. We just dove right in. Number one, we talk about tech stocks. Why are they at all-time highs? Is this a bubble or is it a breakout for tech stocks? Number two, is crypto going to have its moment? Are we going to enter the banana zone? Are we headed for disappointment? This is going to be a, a muted cycle for crypto. Say it ain't so. Number three, how's the US economy really doing? It's really hard to find signal here. I'm getting so many mixed messages. Should we be worried about a recession? Number four, we talk about Powell and his quest to slay inflation. Did he do it? Is he going to lower rates on the back of this? And finally, we conclude by talking about the next potential events that could really move markets. Jim has some really interesting takes here, including takes about the 2024 presidential election. In addition to all these, I even got Jim to talk about the recent crypto ETFs, and he had a bit of a contrarian take on them. And maybe a, a quick spoiler alert, he's not altogether bullish on the crypto ETFs, so stay tuned for that. All right, let's get right to the conversations with Jim Bianco. But before we do, I want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible, including the exchange you should use to transfer your fiat into crypto. That is Kraken. Go create an account. If you want a crypto trading experience backed by world-class security and award-winning support teams, then head over to Kraken, one of the longest standing and most secure crypto platforms in the world. Kraken is on a journey to build a more accessible, inclusive, and fair financial system, making it simple and secure for everyone, everywhere, to trade crypto. Kraken's intuitive trading tools are designed to grow with you, empowering you to make your first or your hundredth trade in just a few clicks. And there's an award-winning client support team available 24-7 to help you along the way, along with a whole range of educational guides, articles, and videos. With products and features like Kraken Pro and Kraken NFT Marketplace and a seamless app to bring it all together, it's really the perfect place to get your complete crypto experience. So check out the simple, secure, and powerful way for everyone to trade crypto, whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned pro. Go to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. The Uniswap extension is almost here. The self-custody wallet created by the most trusted team in DeFi, Uniswap Labs, designed to make swapping feel effortless. This extension lives in your browser's sidebar, letting you swap, sign transactions, and send or receive crypto without ever losing your place on the internet. Plus, with human-readable transaction messages, you'll always know exactly what you're signing. Navigate a multi-chain world effortlessly with support for 11 chains like Ethereum mainnet, Base, Arbitrum, and Optimism. No more chain switching or token importing. All your assets are right where you need them to be. The Uniswap extension is designed to level up your swapping experience with other Uniswap Labs products as well. Easily onboard to the extension using the Uniswap mobile wallet to begin managing your assets across platforms and take advantage of smooth, seamless synergies with the Uniswap web app. So go and sign up for the waitlist today and download the Uniswap app and claim your free username to get added to the extension waitlist. The Uniswap extension is available later this month to everyone. Just another way Uniswap is helping you swap smarter. Have you ever felt that the tools for developing decentralized applications are too restrictive and fail to leverage advancements from traditional software programming? There's a wide range of expressive building blocks beyond conventional smart contracts and solidity development. Don't waste your time building the basics from scratch and don't limit the potential of your vision. Cartesi provides powerful and scalable solutions for developers that supercharge app development. With a Cartesi virtual machine, you can run a full Linux OS and access decades of rich code libraries and open source tooling for building in web 
3. And with Cartesi's unique rollup framework, you'll get real world scaling and computation. No more competing for block space. So if you're a developer looking to push the boundaries of what's possible in Web3, Cartesi is now offering up to $50,000 in grants. Head over to Cartesi's grant application page to apply today. And if you're not a developer, those with staked CTSI can take part in the governance process and vote on whether or not a proposal should be funded. Make sure you're vote ready by staking your CTSI before the votes open. Bankless Station, I'm very excited to be joined once again by Jim Bianco. He's an investor. He's a macro researcher at Bianco Research. He's a friend of the Bankless podcast. He's been a repeat guest a number of times because for David and myself, there's no better bridge between macro and TradFi and crypto than Mr. Jim Bianco. Jim, welcome back to Bankless. Thanks for having me. Jim, you come to us uh, at an important time, I think, because people are trying to figure out what the heck is going on. At least th there's a number of questions in my mind about what's going on in macro, what's going on in crypto. And uh, so that's going to be the focus of the discussion. But this is really loosely organized by the most burning questions, at least in my mind. So we're going to probably hop around a little bit here if, uh, if that sounds good. So uh, the first burning question in my mind is this, and I think a lot of crypto investors and listeners are thinking about this. Why are stocks up, but crypto is not? All right, now th this might be some recency bias. It's felt like this so over the summertime doldrums in, in crypto. So maybe you'll you'll zoom out and tell us that you know it's a it's a, a, a about equal. But it feels like the Nasdaq, the QQQ, the tech stocks in particular are outperforming crypto, and we're doing that thing with you know the the, the boyfriend, the meme kind of looking over his shoulder, and we're just like, hey, look, like, you know the S and P looks pretty good right now. The stocks look pretty good what's happening to crypto. Do you have any explanation for this? Sure. Uh, first of all, let me say at the top, I actually think it's a good thing that crypto start becoming a little bit more independent from the TradFi market. Okay. You know, you just don't want to basically hold out crypto as saying, hey, it's just, you know, a, a high beta or more leveraged play on the TradFi market because, mm -hmm. you know, what are you offering other than just more leverage? You can get that in TradFi. So, in some respects, it should march to its own drummer. Now that I've said that, what do I think is happening? Um, TradFi's got a narrative. The narrative is, is AI. And the AI narrative is actually concentrated in the biggest companies, right? The Magnificent Seven companies. They're 62% of the QQQ index. Seven companies are, uh, they're 33% of the S&P 500. Now those levels, uh, those concentration levels are some of the highest we've ever seen for a handful of stocks. Mm. Uh, I've, I've got data back to the early 1960s and I can't find another time where we've seen five stocks or seven stocks have this big a weighting. Now, of course, what's happening is it's all around AI and the center of the AI universe is NVIDIA. NVIDIA makes the chips for AI. Here's something I think a lot of people don't realize. Um, who... Where does AI get 50%, 50% of its revenue? Gets its revenue from five companies. And who are those five companies? They're OpenAI, they're Microsoft, they're Meta, <laughs> they're Tesla. So it's like, it's all circular is yeah. what it is. Yeah. You know, these companies all buy, Tesla has bought $1 billion worth of, of NVIDIA chips just this year. And so it's all because of... Um, you know, uh, their, their, their automatic pilot, their driving service, and they want to push, um, and they want to push AI down on that. And of course, with uh, X2 and Gronk, that, that, it's very expensive to do that. So it's got this narrative that AI is coming, it's going to be as big as the internet itself, and everybody is piling into that. Now, the problem with that is it kind of sucks up all the oxygen in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, over here, you got the crypto guys going a new a new financial system or store of wealth. If you're talking about Bitcoin, yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm going I'm going for the new the new you know Internet 2.0 play, which is AI, and that's what's got everybody rushing into those stocks. So when you look at the S and P and you look at the uh, 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 the QQQ, understand that in the S and P, over half of the return in the S and P has been seven stocks. Over two thirds of the return in QQQ has been seven stocks, and on top of that, a good third of the return in those has been Nvidia um, alone. So that's the narrative that's been driving this. So if you're a Bitcoin maxi and you're saying no, no, you want to buy Bitcoin, 
make the case that it's better than NVIDIA, which is up 200% this year. Uh, and that's really what you're, you're, you're fighting with when it comes to narratives. If you're looking for people to move money into the crypto space, well, they recognize that the crypto space is a space of high volatility in uh, wild returns. Um, you've got to convince them to leave the AI space. The AI space has been making them a lot of money over the last two years, and they're very well into it. So I think it really comes down to that narrative competition right now. You have to be better than AI, and it's been very difficult. Okay, so AI is is just grabbing all of the attention and therefore all of the uh, all of the capital. I I want to echo what what you just said. I'm 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 sharing a um a, a tweet here from Eric Balchunas who uh, points out that the top just agreeing on your consolidation uh, take here, Jim. The top mm-hmm. ten biggest stocks in the S and P five hundred contributed to seventy seven percent of the index's total return in the first half of this year. And that is the second highest ever recorded of that number. The only Can I make time a quick it's comment ever about been higher. That. Yeah. It's, and yeah, it, look, it, at, look at 2007, which was yes. higher, but look at what the total return for the whole year was, was three and a half percent. Yeah, you know, what's up with but, this? So, so the only time it was higher was 2007. Right, but if it was only three and a half percent, what that means is that roughly speaking, that the top 10 stocks returned you 2% in a 3.5% world. Mm. But look at 2024, look at 2023, which is an extension of 2024, 24% and 15%. So those top 10%, those top 10% stocks are returning you a lot more than they did in 2007. So what does that tell you? What, what they, so, I, so we've got the consult, the concentration of 2007, but we have better returns. Is that right? What does that mean? But you're just you're getting you're getting much bigger returns mm. out of those top ten stocks this year. Just absolute returns. You're getting much bigger bigger returns than you did in 2007. In 2007, it was almost a quirk that the, the basically the the stock market didn't even outperform cash in 2007 because you know T bills were yielding five percent that year, and you could have made five percent in a T bill. You made three and a half percent in the stock market, and you made two percent in the top ten stocks. So a lot of people looked at that and kind of shrugged their shoulders. So what? It's not very exciting. But this year, with these big returns and these big returns being concentrated with bigger returns in the top ten stocks. That's what's capturing everybody's attention. And that's why that's what makes this year, and of course, last year's an extension of it, um, unique in anything that we've seen before. Okay. So in, in another year, I, I was just noticing as you were talking that that makes the top five is 1999. And I, I, I want to get your take for uh, like just this this chart here. What I'm showing on the screen is, is kind of the NASDAQ from the 1980s. Of course, NASDAQ, we've used that interchangeably. If you don't speak TradFi with QQQ, that is a, a Na- QQQ is a NASDAQ uh, index. And we just see kind of like this, this chart uh, going absolutely, uh, you know, we'd call this in, in crypto, maybe it was something close to parabolic. It's definitely up and to the right. And uh, one year that um, I, I just referenced was 1999. And people look at this when it comes from a narrative perspective. So, that, hey, there's one big narrative that's just winning out uh, this concentration of, of stocks. It sort of reminds people of what was going on in 1999 with, with dot coms. Even this element of, you know, uh, NVIDIA, where is it receiving its, its cash flow? Well, it's just like a bunch of tech companies, right? For, you know, like five of them, uh, for instance. And, and you're pointing out that it's very self-referential. That was going on in 1999 as well. I remember a, a stock, in my early investing days, uh, yeah, I, I was uh, still a youngster at this stage, but I was looking at the dot-com stocks like Yahoo. And uh, Yahoo's revenue at that time, the late 1990s was like off the charts. It was amazing, right? It was just like growing so fast. And yeah, revenue is a real metric, isn't it? This is cash. Turns out a lot of that revenue was advertising revenue from all of the other dot-com tech companies. And it was self-referential yet again. So there is kind of this question, right? It's like AI is going to be transformational. It's an incredible narrative. I mean, all of us have used AI tools uh, by now. ChatGPT really is amazing. I'm running it on my machine. It's like you know, like an AI agent that I, I use on a regular basis. So there really is this transformation happening. But there's this question of, are we in a bubble? Is that why stocks have become discorrelated from everything else, in particular, these, these large tech stocks and and the Nasdaq. What do you think about that? When you hear the word a bubble, is this is this chart, does this remind you of a, a breakout or is it a bubble? 
You know, that's a good question. I think we're somewhere in between. Let me explain. If you look at that 2000 peak on the chart, um, it doesn't look very big because it's an arithmetic chart. It'd be much different if we put it on a log scale. But that said, look at when we, that was 5,000 on the NASDAQ. That's what the uh, horizontal dotted line is. When was the time that it really broke through 5,000? It was 16 years later. So when you basically made that in 2000 peak, it held for 16 years before the stock market, or at least the NASDAQ, made a new high. Mm. Now, what happened in 98 and 99 was people got excited about the entire idea that the internet was going to be on everybody's desk and it was going to be this transformational tool, which it was. And we started to buy anything and everything associated with the internet. And by the way, one of the leading stocks back then was Cisco, which made routers, the hardware for the internet, and where NVIDIA is making the chips, which is the hardware for AI. So there's definitely been a lot of people pointing out that parallel as well. And so what the stock market is doing is it's pulling forward future gains, you know, with adoption of the internet. It pulled forward so many of those gains by the end of 99 into early 2000 that it took the internet adoption 16 years to catch up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so really what you're talking about is all the AI hype that you have now, yes, every single inch of that AI hype is going to happen. But is it going to happen in the next 12 months or is it going to happen in the next 16 years? Because if it happens in the next 12 months, then these stocks will stay at these levels. If this AI hype is going to take 16 years to unfold, then we might see some kind of a replay of where we are or where we were in the late 90s. Now, I tend to think that this AI hype is getting to be a little bit over that, yes, we will eventually get there. Look, 25 years later, whatever the wild-eyed estimates were for what the internet meant in 99 has been fulfilled. It just took a lot longer than we thought it was going to take. And that's the, the risk that you face with AI. You'll get there, but, you, but the price where the prices are now, you have to get there next year. Otherwise, there's going to be a massive disappointment with a lot of these companies. I think I hear you saying then, Jim, more towards, it's getting more frothy, it's getting more foamy, it's getting more <laughs> bubble territory right now. And so is your radar going off towards the, the B word? Yes, it is. It is. But what if I if I could mix my metaphors and throw in a baseball analogy, I know what people say when you say bubble. They say, "Okay, ninth inning, two outs, two strikes." <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it still might be the sixth or seventh inning, but okay. it is getting, or maybe it is in the ninth inning. Yeah. But you know, it is bubblicious, but that doesn't mean <laughs> you know, go ahead, get a cup of coffee, and then sell every stock that you own right now sure. because it's going to crash this afternoon. It could still last for several more months, or a year or two more, or maybe it's really you know, there right now. So I don't know that part, but yes, it is getting definitely that towards that B word. I mean, we could be over here on the charts. We could be like a 1997 or something here, which uh, did look like a spike up, but there was still a lot more to go on on this chart. And exactly. I, I'm, I'm curious what, what your take is on uh, stocks overall. And I, I was looking at this, uh, this is um, a tweet on the buffer, the Buffett indicator, I should say. The Buffett yep. indicator has officially crossed 195% for the first time in history. It's higher than the dot-com bubble, than the global financial crisis and the 2022 COVID crash. I had to remind myself what the Buffett indicator is. It's actually the, the ratio of total stock market to GDP, right? So GDP is the total economic output of the, of the U.S., and uh, it's taking a ratio of um, the stock market, all of the, the market cap of all stocks to GDP. Uh, it says in Buffett's eyes, this is the, the best value indicator. And here's the chart right here. And we can see it's uh, mm -hmm. all-time highs uh, as, of, as of right now. And so this would indicate that stocks are expensive. They're overpriced, at least according to the Buffett indicator. But also when I look at this chart, Jim, and it was this way in, in the late 90s, in 2000s, the Buffett indicator was kind of like unprecedented at that time. Now it's above 2000s. I look at this chart and I'm like, okay, I see some overvalue here potentially, but also it looks like the metric is kind of broken because we've been overvalued for a, a very long time, at least since <laughs> you know, like the start of quantitative easing uh, seemed to you know, like start to pump all asset prices. So what does this mean to you? Like, is a metric like this even even useful in trying to assess the relative value of, of stocks versus everything else? 
It is, but you have to put it in context. By the way, um, think plan B, stock to flow. That's what this is. You know, it's basically, you know, the 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 size of the stock market and GDP is flow. Uh, and so it's, but it's stock to flow for the entire US economy. And what it's basically telling you is the stock market is at overvalued range. Now, the one thing you've always got to remember is valuation is never a timing tool in that. So you can be overvalued and you can be overvalued for a long time. So what good is a valuation tool? It tells you when the correction comes, it's going to be very painful. Because if you start a correction from a very overvalued place, it's going to go down a long way. If you start a, a correction from a not overvalued place, to use bad English, it's, it's not going to correct this much. So what this indicator is telling you is, yeah, everything's fine. You're making money, you're making money. And then be careful because if you're not paying attention, you might wind up losing two thirds of your value because there could be a very stiff correction coming at some point in the future when the stock market turns. And I'll end this idea with, by the way, who is a big proponent of the Buffett indicator? is Warren Buffett himself. Uh, Warren Buffett currently is largely defensively positioned. He owns 3% of all treasury bills that the U.S. government <laughs> no has way. issued. Really? Yeah. I mean, he owns more than central banks do right now. He is positioned that he is so worried about the, def about the level of the stock market right now. He is hiding and getting, he's getting 5% a year in treasury bills. So it's not like he's getting nothing. Sure. But he has definitely been very defensive and hiding, and he's really well away from the stock market. Basically, what Buffett is thinking, you got to remember the way Buffett is thinking, yeah, I like this company, and I like that company, and I think I'm going to be able to buy it 40 or 50% cheaper in the future. So I'm going to hide away in cash, and then when they, when they all crack up and fall in half, then I'm going to swoop in and buy them. Maybe it's a couple of years from now. Maybe it's later this year. But I'm 92 years old and I learned how to be patient. That's kind of the way that Buffett thinks about things. So do you think he's right? I mean, to wait? Uh, he's Warren Buffett because that's the way he's <laughs> operated for 60 years. <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, you remember, remember, this is the guy, this is the, yes, he, I think he is right. But he is a, a, a unique, he is of a unique style that everybody wants to emulate, but very few can. Warren likes to say, you know, you should buy stocks or buy a stock index like SPY, and then don't even look at its price for five years. There's only one person who's ever existed that can do that, and that's Warren <laughs> Buffett. The rest of us can't go five minutes without that's looking true. at it. Uh, especially, you know? yeah. So his style works, and his style works for him, and others have tried to emulate it as well. So I think, you know, for the long haul, I think he he's probably right, but for the rest of us, do we really want to be that patient? Do we really want to take that kind of approach? We would like to. You know, it's it's kind of like, you know, we all like would would all like to improve our diet and exercise more and lose a couple of pounds, but that but it's hard for us to do it, just like it's hard for us to emulate uh, Buffett's style. Well, something else I was I was mentioning. So we've had a uh, um high rates, high-ish rates for for a while now, which has uh, led to Buffett uh, apparently uh, getting up to up to three percent of uh, of all uh, treasuries, which is uh, incredible to me. I was looking at money market funds, and uh, this is a a source where where I keep um, some of like my value. I'm excited about honestly treasuries these days at a five percent yield relative to other things. Uh, and this is a money market fund assets reaching a new record. There's about seven trillion dollars in money market funds, and what's happening is. I think like if you think about a small retail investor, they're looking at their Wells Fargo savings account. It's delivering like, you know, 0.25%, something just like it's not even worth it. And some of that cash is is bleeding out into money market funds, into, into treasuries. Um, but the uh, overarching tweet here is uh, money market funds are at an all-time high. What do you think is going to happen if Powell starts increasing the rates again? Well, that capital will leak out of money market funds, leak out of treasuries, and back to risk on assets, back to uh, back to stocks. And so we will get a another pump into the stock market and risk on assets as um, you know, like the the rate interest rates. Uh, decrease because you know people will be in search of, um, I guess, yields in other locations. What, what do you make of what's going on with money markets, bonds, treasuries, and could this be a positive catalyst for uh, some of the assets that we were talking about? Maybe, you know, uh, pump pump the bubble to new highs. 
Yeah, it can be, but let's 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 put this in the you know a tradfi perspective. You know, what do most tradfi investors think that the stock market is going to do? Well, let's look at the book Stocks for the Long Run written by Dr. Jeremy Siegel. He put out a new edition of the book last year. And in it, he said, what is the long-term return potential for the stock market? That it's about 8% a year, right? It could be 16% one year, zero the next year. Um, and But usually you should get around an 8-ish percent return. Historically, that's been the case. And it makes sense why you should expect that in the future. Okay, so most TradFi investors go into the stock market, go into structuring a portfolio, either by themselves or with a wealth manager, thinking, I want to get 8% a year, is what they think. I know that most Gen Z and, and younger millennials go into crypto thinking, I want to get 8% a day, but, that, <laughs> but you got to keep in mind that that's their, that's their mentality, is that they want to get about 8% a year. Okay, then they look over and they look at a money market fund and they say, okay, that's yielding, the average money market fund in the United States right now is yielding 5.3%. They go, wait a minute, isn't that about two thirds or 70% of mm. that 8% number? And a money market fund has a net asset value. Its price is $1 every single day. It has no risk because it just has the same price every day. And they go, okay, I'll take two thirds or 70% of what I should get out of the stock market without any risk. And that's why you've seen this big rush in the money market funds. And you're right, it is not going to stop until interest rates are cut. And then you could scream that word that we used to use before the pandemic called Tina. There is no alternative. You got to get your money back in the stocks. But it's going to take more than one cut to get that money out of money market funds. It's probably going to take three or four. And we are now talking about potentially the first rate cut coming in the middle of September. The second rate cut, maybe, maybe towards the end of the year. And you know, we could talk about this later, but I have, I'm a little bit more hawkish. I don't think the Fed's going to cut as much as everybody thinks. But if when are we going to get those three or four rate cuts? It might not be for another year or so, unless the economy goes bad real fast. So yeah, this can be a, a source of funds to push into riskier assets, but not for several months or maybe a year, assuming we get those rate cuts, as everybody points out. I might add, if I was here in January, we were talking about Fed's going to cut rates six times in 2024. Well, here we are now in the middle of July, and they still haven't pulled the trigger. So it's easy for us to say, yes, they're going to cut in September, and yes, they'll cut one more time in December. But let's all remember that the people that are saying that have been wrong for eight months. And now eventually, if they just keep saying forever, the Fed's going to cut, at some point, they're going to look like Nostradamus because they will <laughs> cut. But that's the issue that they have to, you, you, know, you have to face, is that we're going to need lots of cuts before we could really start turning to those people and say, you don't want to get 4%. You want to get eight in the stock market. Um, so then you might start to see some movement. But right now, I don't think that money's going to move at all. If anything, I think as the line shows on that chart, it's going to keep going up over the over the near term, the near term being the next couple of months. All right. And I said we were going to uh, jump around a little bit. And I, I do want to uh, get into inflation and, and Powell and if you know, what the broader context of uh, all of this that, that's going on is. But uh, you know, before that, let's ju let's jump to crypto really quick because okay. my starter question was why are stocks outperforming crypto? And we talked about the the story around stocks, and I think you gave uh, like a, a reasonable explanation as to why stocks are outperforming so hard. But crypto, why has crypto been underperforming? Uh, at least in the last couple of months, it's been flattish, underperforming. And uh, so, so let's talk about the crypto story. And I, I want to maybe ask um, in, in the broadest way, what your base case prediction for crypto this cycle is. I would say um, for, for you know, like most bankless listeners, um, let me describe the base cases. We're in another four-year cycle, right? We've had three of these before. This is the fourth. And so we're expecting something like the other three, right? Where we get the seasons in crypto, we've, we, get, we get winter, 
uh, we get spring, we get summer, we get fall, and we get winter again, right? It's, you know, four years, four seasons, and we are maybe somewhere between spring and summer. Maybe we're in summer, we're just in the summer doldrums, but we're still in a bull market, and the best is yet to come. Our friend uh, Raul Paul calls this a banana zone, uh, where he thinks things are going to, you know, like shoot up as they have in other cycles. Um, so that's probably the base case prediction that uh, most crypto natives have been thinking about. This is another four-year cycle, and of course, you know, these cycles don't play up up only. It can get slow for times, but we're still in the bull season. We're still in summer, entering summer, something like this, and the best is yet to come. What is your base case prediction for crypto? Let's call it this cycle. So I, I, I'll tend to agree with that. You know, I think we're kind of, you know, late May and the weather's a little bit below average and it's raining out, but, you know, summer is still coming. Uh, and I am generally bullish on the space. And my maxi friends on crypto Twitter are still trying to rip my heart out because I've been saying some not no nice, nice things about the ETF. <laughs> so let me explain my position. Okay. I'm on the Bankless podcast, which is the perfect place for me to explain this position. I look at crypto and I look at the entire space and I say, this is the creation of a new financial system, a permissionless digital financial system, decentralized as well. As long as the space continues to move in that direction, I'm all in. I am, and I still am all in, and I am bullish on the space. But when you start getting deviations from that, you know, and piss off some other people here, one of those deviations might be Solana, because I'm not so sure how decentralized it is. Um, convince me, guys, that it's decentralized is what I want to say, because I'm skeptical of it. Another one is what's happening with the ETFs. The ETFs, the 10 uh, uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs, have come out and as a group, they have been the most successful launch of an ETF in terms of new money coming in in history. But what is that new money that's coming in? Now, a lot of the Bitcoin crowd has just decided that it's the Greenwich Country Club calling their wealth manager saying, put 5% of my net worth into, into the spot Bitcoin ETFs. <laughs> and what we're learning is it's nothing like that at all. Hmm. Uh, you know, it is it is all the institutions adopting it. Yeah, there's a handful of exceptions, but it's nothing like that at all. It's coming from largely two spaces, the money that's going into the ETFs. It's coming from small retail momentum players. I used to call them DGENs. I'm going to stop calling them DGENs because I realized that that's an inflammatory word and I don't want to get hung up on that. And most of it is coming from on-chain. CryptoQuant, JP Morgan have done some analysis that at its peak, $16 billion has gone into the ETFs. Where has that money come from? They're estimating 13 billion of it was on chain in a wallet, and they just moved it back to the regulated brokerage account and they bought Larry Fink's Magic ETF. Hmm. If that's what we're doing with these ETFs is we're giving people an incentive to get off on chain, it's too hard to do your taxes, it's too tough, I don't have to remember that. You know, Eric Balkunis, tweeted out that um, no one's got time to remember a 12-word seed phrase. <laughs> uh, the ETF fixes that. Right. Yeah, well, that's the end of the crypto space. If we're all going to just say, screw the L2s and screw all the DEXs and screw all the electronic wallets, and sorry, MetaMask and everybody else, we're going to just all go back into our Schwab account and we're going to buy Larry Fink's ETF, we're not going to get there. And that's what my concern has been, is that we're going in the other direction. It should be a wake-up call to the devs that is, you know, I've been in this space since 2017. And I would argue to you, it's 100x easier to, to traffic in the digital space now than it was seven years ago. But for most normies, it's still impossible. Even Coinbase is impossible for them. They're just comfortable in their current TradFi account, and they want to buy the facsimile of crypto, which is the spot ETF. But again, if, if you want to go the next step, you need to develop a whole ecosystem. And in order to develop an ecosystem, you need to get people on chain. And the ETFs are not the gateway 
oh yeah, we're going to take a bunch of normies and they're going to buy the, the Bitcoin ETF and they're going to get comfortable and then they're going to research it and then they're going to open up an electronic wallet and we're, and it's going to be the gateway to get them in. It's the opposite. It's the gateway to get them back in the, in the TradFi. If the argument is going to be that crypto is going to go to the moon because we're going to allow Larry Fink to swallow it up and Gary Gensler to regulate the ownership of crypto through the ETFs, yes, the, the issuance of crypto through the decentralized blockchain may exist, but if you're going to allow the, them to regulate the ownership of it, they own you. They own you. They're going to make all the rules on you, and we're never going to get to that space. So I think really there's two problems here. Problem one is the net new money that's coming into this space, which is holding back the price, isn't as great as we think it is, that mm. the ETFs are just showing us that it's China. This is a giant swap people out of their electronic wallets into their regulated brokerage exchanges. And two, if that's indeed the case, we're kind of going in the wrong direction here. We want to get more people comfortable with using these decentralized tools and using these on-chain tools and learning how to use that system. And so that's what I think is kind of holding it back. The biggest example might be the, you know, the week we're recording, um, recording on July 12th, a billion dollars has come in, a one billion dollars would it be has come into the uh, spot ETFs this week, and the price hasn't done anything. Now, why isn't the price gone anywhere if a billion dollars has come into those ETFs? Because obviously, somewhere, somebody else sold a billion dollars, and that's why we've, we're, we've kind of gone somewhere. And maybe some of those people that sold that billion dollars, maybe that is that they're moving you know, back from on-chain back into the regulated account. That is the issue that we have to deal with, is that it isn't the great, you know, um, adoption tool that everybody was hoping, that the boomers are coming. You know, I've heard Dylan LeClaire and a lot of people say, the boomers are coming, the boomers are coming. No, they're not. They're, 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 they're playing golf in the Greenwich Country Club, and they're yelling at their wealth managers that they don't own enough NVIDIA. In Bitcoin, yeah, yeah, just give me an NVIDIA. That's really the conversation they're having with their wealth managers. They're not really having a Bitcoin conversation with them right now. And so that's really where the problem faces, is that it's, it's, it's stuck behind that AI narrative. And most of the money that you're seeing that you think is coming in is really on-chain money moving back to regulated accounts. That's a, a really, really good take. I, I definitely sh share uh, many of your concerns that, uh, that that you stated here, Jim, particularly around kind of like the centralization vector that this could be. I do think that um, the Bitcoin ETF in particular could struggle for this uh, more than um, possibly the Ethereum ETF, just because there's less to do on Bitcoin, right? It's much more, it's a more custodied asset, but this is also a trap for Ethereum as well. And yeah, like to your point from 2017 until now, it has gotten easier to use crypto. I would hundred percent agree with you. It's gotten 10 to hundred X easier. And yet it is still not ready for my parents, let's say. It's still not ready for our, our grandmothers. Like it's still uh, very difficult. We haven't solved some of the key UX uh, issues. And we're just now unlocking, you know, um, you know transactions that don't uh, cost, you know, hundreds of dollars or, or, or tens of dollars, right? We're just unlocking that. We still haven't fixed wallet user experience. Like there's so much more to, to fix here. So while the ETF stuff is uh, cool in a way, I guess your message is be cautious. This is not going to be the thing that takes crypto uh, to, to the moon. Um, but I want to ask you about other TradFi involvement and whether you think this kind of, um, you know, carries through. I guess, you know, one thing that, that TradFi is doing as well is, is getting on the tokenization uh, bandwagon, right? And, the, you know, one thing that has been tokenized um, from 2017 up to now and is, and is growing that I think you've, you've been bullish on in the past is stable coins. And I, I, I remember you, you coming on Bankless and um, being worried, maybe this was in 2022, you were a little bit worried about crypto and DeFi because you saw the, the supply of stable coins just kind of like halting and like starting to go down. And so some of your, your warning levels were, uh, were, were, were flashing because you, know, you, you saw at the time stable coins being sort of a source of liquidity for DeFi. Um, stable coins are now back to all-time high. This is a chart from Visa. So we're back to all-time high. 
uh, as of as of today, there's about um, let's see, 150 billion dollars worth of of stable coins on chain. Not all time high by much, but it has grown since um, the previous bear markets. What's your take on stable coins? You know, tokenized treasuries are now at 1.3. Um, billion dollars, and you know the Biddle Fund from BlackRock has a push. You can hear all of these like uh, TradFi institutions talking about, you know, tokenization, like Larry Fink, etc. Do you think that is bullish for the space, or do you have the same critique that you just gave about the the ETF? No, I think that that's really bullish for the space because that's what you want. You want adoption. You want on chain adoption, and you want people to when they get on chain as opposed to what Bitcoin is, you know, I'm done. I'm just going to custody this and wait for number to go up, that there's things you can do. You can lend it, you can borrow it, you can stake it, um, you can transact in it. Uh, and so as these stable coins start to appreciate in value, I think, you know, you're going to start to see, uh, you know, more, you're going to see, start to see more DeFi, you know, you're going to see more TVL in DeFi, uh, and uh, you're going to start to see the space offer alternatives for people to start looking at either adopting it as a, a merchant, maybe I'll accept payment in, in a stable coin, or as a, as a user that I can use these stable coins and the DeFi space to do more things. I think one of the biggest issues that we, we struggled with, you know, in, in 22 and in 23 was, you know, one of the, one of the biggest stable coins out there uh, was UST and that blew up. And <laughs> yes. then we had USDC, you know, USDC had presented itself as, you know, the re as the safe, mature version of a stable coin. And then it got swallowed up in this uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank issue where it had a bunch of its assets with Silicon Valley Bank and it briefly broke the buck down the 88 cents. Now, it recovered because Silicon Valley Bank never held back their money, but it scared the hell out of a lot of people. It was yes, very it damaging did. for their reputation is what it was. And at, along those same lines, as if you remember during the, during the winter of 22 and 23, if you talk to any TradFi person, they all had the one TradFi trade of all TradFi trades was, I'm going to short Tether. And it was like every coin <laughs> fell 90%. I about that. Yeah. Every coin, like all, every coin fell 90% except Tether. So they found the one coin that short that didn't go down <laughs> during that period. Well, you know, and it was Chinese, you know, I mean, you're going back to asset flashback to bad memories, right? Yeah. Remember it was the Chinese commercial paper that they wouldn't tell us all about and everything. They've kind of worked that issue out now. And they're, they're kind of leading the charge in terms of stable coins coming back. So Tether... He's got that big first mover advantage. It was the first stable coin. It seems to be back on, on going. So if stable coins continue to go, think of them, you know, it's the dollar. It's a, it's a, it's a dollar in the, the crypto space. It opens it up for a lot more tokenization, transactions, lending, staking, trading, everything else, because you've got this $1 stable token that you can use. And I think that could really lead to a lot of more adoption in the space. So I'm very high on that idea that finally the stable coins are starting to come back and they're starting to come back in, in the right way. And that we hopefully we're going to see that long haul adoption and then all of the ecosystem around them continue to grow. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, so this is still a metric that you pay attention to then. It would be great to see this at rather than 150 billion, you know, 500 billion and and uh, closer to a trillion and uh, you know, tokenized treasuries taking a similar trajectory. Uh, coming back to the uh, the ETF story, um, one of the interesting things I I, I got to say the Ethereum ETF sort of caught us by surprise over the last couple of months. I don't know if you were anticipating that. I thought there was a chance, but it was more like a hail mary pass. And then suddenly, on one particular uh, like day of the week, um, we we got this 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 note from the SEC. I think it was a Thursday that the Ethereum ETF was approved, right? And so that's interesting. You've given your comments about kind of like the ETF itself, um, but what it also sh you know portended was a political shift that I think has been happening in the U.S. And uh, you know, I, I of course in the U.S. we've had a lot of regulatory hostility towards crypto. We've had 
you know, the banks being uh, choked off uh, in crypto. We've had aggressive regulators, uh, the Gary Genslers uh, of the world coming out against this industry, trying to like choke it off in various ways. And then there was this, um, I guess, you know, light uh, shining through the clouds of uh, an Ethereum ETF out of left field being approved. Now we're, we're at a place where uh, crypto, it seems, has become a 2022 political issue. We've got Donald Trump now speaking at a crypto conference. We've got increased pressure on uh, Democrats as well on like being less crypto hostile. I saw this from Hayden Adams, um, a uh, Democratic um, representative, Ro Khanna, organized and moderated a roundtable around DeFi with Hayden Adams and Uniswap and Mark Cuban was there. So they're starting to be receptive. The Republicans have come out with uh, the GOP platform policy. This is like their policy paper. They had a section under innovation, championing innovation. There's a paragraph on crypto that reads pretty well, actually, Jim. So it says uh, they will, Republicans will end Democrats' unlawful and un-American crypto crackdown oppose the creation of a central bank digital currency, will defend the right to mine Bitcoin, this is my favorite part, and ensure every American has a right to self-custody of their digital assets, the right to go bankless as part of their, their platform, and transact free from government surveillance and control. Now, of course, politicians say things, and there's political platforms. So like the difference between that is also follow through and how much can you really, you know, trust. I, I don't. I don't have to inject uh, cynicism, political cynicism, into our audience. I think they already have that. But we have seen some political winds change, and that has been part of the Ethereum ETF story. Do you think that is a bullish catalyst for for crypto? And you like, how do you take all of this news? When it was approved, I did. I tweeted out that I thought it was extraordinarily bullish. Remember the price of I think ETH was up like twenty percent that day. Yeah. The you know the day that it was approved, and it was more about not that the ETF is coming that that was going to be transformational, but that this whole argument about whether or not proof of stake is a security is blown up if the if the SEC approves an uh, you know an ETH ETF because you can't you can't tell me that ETH is an unregistered security because it's proof of stake. And oh, by the way, you could then approve an ETF that trades on it. Exactly. It's almost like a, a it's almost like an admission that you're giving up on whether or not it is an unregulated security. And so that's really the the approval of that ETF was really that a lot of the regulatory uncertainty was was you know, resolved all in that one spot. And I think it's definitely uh, moving in that direction. It, you know, you're right. Trump is speaking, I think, next month or Bitcoin Miami is when he's going to speak. Uh, and um, the Democrat Party trying to appeal to younger voters is all of a sudden gotten a lot more, um, you know, um, open to the idea of crypto. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the yeah, I, I hate to put the cynicism in. If <laughs> if Liz Warren gets reelected, and if yep. uh, and if the Democrat Party, maybe it's Biden or whoever, gets reelected, and Liz Warren's there, I wonder what their position on crypto will be in 2025. I feel fairly confident that the current position of the Republican Party on crypto, win or lose, will be the same p position that they will have in 2025, or roughly the same position that they will have in 2025. But nevertheless. The move, the definitely the move towards allowing this asset is is underway. And what's also helping is things like these ETFs and tokenization, that these big companies are not just sitting around going, it's a bunch of tulip bulbs and no one should touch it and stuff. They're getting involved. And if they're going to get involved, they're not going to want the SEC and the Treasury um, and the Federal Reserve to basically shut down this new business venture for them. So I definitely see us moving in that direction. You're right, we got to get the UI UX better. We're getting some more clarity on the, um, uh, on the uh, uh, regulatory front in this country. So that's why I said I'm bullish, I'm very bullish on the long term that we're moving in the right direction. The current TradFi system, which I've been in for 30 years, more, actually closer to 40, is ripe for disruption. It needs to be disrupted. And I think this is how the crypto space is how it's eventually going to get disrupted. 
And hopefully it will. And I think a lot of the players in that space are no longer trying to fight that disruption, but they're trying to say, look, let's play along with the disruption. You know, they watch the newspapers try and tell everybody, don't go, go, don't go get your news from the internet. You want to continue to pay us a dollar a day to buy your local newspaper and we'll tell you what you need to know. And that didn't work out very well for them. So they're not going to try and do that with the current TradFi system. They're going to try and move along with it. So we are going there in fits and starts, and I'm very bullish on this space long term. New projects are coming online to the Mantle Layer 2 every single week. Why is this happening? Maybe it's because Mantle has been on the frontier of Layer 2 design architecture since it first started building Mantle DA, powered by technology from Eigen DA. Maybe it's because users are coming onto the Mantle Layer 2 to capture some of the highest yields available in DeFi and to automatically receive the points and tokens being accrued by the $3 billion Mantle Treasury in the Mantle Rewards station. Maybe it's because the Mantle team is one of those helpful teams to build with, giving you grants, liquidity support, and venture partners to help bootstrap your Mantle application. Maybe it's all of these reasons all put together. So if you're a dev and you want to build on one of the best foundations in crypto, or you're a user looking to claim some ownership on Mantle's DeFi apps, click the link in the show notes to getting started with Mantle. Arbitrum is the leading Ethereum scaling solution that is home to hundreds of decentralized applications. Arbitrum's technology allows you to interact with Ethereum at scale with low fees, and faster transactions. Arbitrum has the leading DeFi ecosystem, strong infrastructure options, flourishing NFTs, and is quickly becoming the Web3 gaming hub. Explore the ecosystem at portal.arbitrum.io. Are you looking to permissionlessly launch your own Arbitrum Orbit chain? Arbitrum Orbit allows anyone to utilize Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own Orbit chain, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. Whether you are a developer, an enterprise, or a user, Arbitrum Orbit lets you take your project to new heights. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum. Experience Web3 development the way it was always meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Visit Arbitrum.io and get your journey started in one of the largest Ethereum communities. Launching a token? Don't let complex legal and tax issues slow you down. Toku provides specialized support to optimize your launch and ensure that you as a founder and your team and your investors get the most tax efficient outcomes. The Toku team understands the crypto space inside and out and will ensure your token launch is fully compliant while maximizing tax efficiency. Toku can connect you with the best attorneys if you need them to make sure that you have the best advice and Toku can help to optimize your taxes so you pay the least possible amount of taxes while still maintaining legal compliance. With Toku's guidance, you can concentrate on building your company while Toku handles the logistics. Token launches don't have to be complicated. Talk to Toku today to get a free initial token valuation. Okay, so let, let, let me inject some cold water into our, our bullishness just to just to make sure we're, <laughs> we're steel manning the alternative case. So you think it's somewhat, somewhat like maybe it's May, for example, in, in the crypto cycle where we're at the beginning of entering uh, summertime in another four right. year cycle. So new all time highs. Like uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin, you know, going up. I don't know if you have price predictions on this. Maybe we can get to that at the end of the episode. But significantly, Ether going up significantly. Long tail of crypto assets going up significantly. But what if that doesn't happen? And let me give you some uh, like takes on why it might not happen. So uh, the negative signals in crypto retail really hasn't come yet this cycle. Uh, it very much seems this way. If you look at kind of like. Coinbase uh, tra traffic, other indicators. Retail is not fully here. I mean, fits and starts, you see them in like doing things in meme coins, but mostly that's like PVP, like crypto. It's just the crypto natives being bored and just doing meme coin shenanigans. Um, we also don't really have a killer breakout app this cycle. You know, previous cycles, we're, we're discovering DeFi for the very first time. We're discovering NFTs. And wh what's the equivalent for this cycle? We haven't yet seen it. And uh, I think there is this underlying almost like nihilism, cynicism that pervades the space, even among the multi-cycle crypto natives, uh, you know, like somewhat, but also just like in general, if the outside looking in, that, that crypto is just not going to live up to the hype. It's not like AI. It's not going to be tra transformational. It's just a giant casino. You know, Bitcoin's 15 years old. Ethereum is nine years old. You'd think they would have figured it out by now. You'd think the use cases would have emerged faster, and they're just not. So maybe this is kind of a casino and a small niche, not what all the crypto bulls thought it would be. Obviously, this is not my perspective. It's not the bankless uh, canon perspective. But let's steel man this argument here a little bit. Like, do you think there's any merit to to this? There's a lot of merit to all of those arguments, and that's why I think that this has been 
taking such a long period of time to unfold. The biggest merit in that argument is that Crypto tends to want to focus on the casino aspects of it. You know, everybody wants to talk about price predictions, number go up, as opposed to, you know, take the AI thing. Um, when you t when you talk to people about AI, they are going to tell you what AI is going to do to revolutionize the world. And when it does that, don't worry about Nvidia; its price will make you wealthy. So we're not we're not we're, you know, talking about Nvidia number go up. We're talking about what AI is going to do for the world. That's what crypto's got to do. What's crypto going to do for the world? And so, as opposed to talking about when are we going to have the next wedge breakout to you know <laughs> a, a, some kind of projection in yeah. the price. Now I actually think that what might help that is some of the tradition the tradfi firms coming in because if they're going to bring a mentality to this space. The mentality of this space is not going to be that we need to get Bitcoin above 100 and then we're going to FOMO everybody for the next 100. No, their, their, their argument is, how are we going to get everybody to start using this as an alternative to the US dollar in the current TradFi system, either as a store of value or a medium of exchange um, and or is it at, at some transaction level? That's where they're going to start to push real hard. And I think that once they start doing that, I think that you could pr definitely see the price go. And you're absolutely right that every big major pump in crypto comes from new innovation. 2020 summer, DeFi summer, 2022 NFTs, 2024, I think the, the killer app for 2024 was supposed to be the ETF, but it really hasn't played, it's not a negative, the ETF, other than maybe it's dragging money on from on chain back into the TradFi world, but at a minimum, it's just not it's just not living up to the hype because every killer app, whether it is DeFi or an NFT, drags more people in to the on chain world. The ETF is not doing that, and that was supposed to be the original. That was supposed to be the killer app at the beginning of the year. So now we're waiting for something else to come along that might be the killer app. We're talking more about tokenization. I think tokenization of treasuries might be a very interesting one. You know, the treasury's got a lot of debt they got to issue. And if they could find other ways to get other people involved in it, like tokenizing treasuries on chain, um, that could be very interesting as well. I know a lot of a lot of people are pushing real hard to get into this space in a tokenized way. So maybe that will be it. But I agree with you that part of the mentality of the space has got to be we need to get everybody to use this alternative financial system. Part of the problem with Bitcoin is they think we're done. We've created the perfect <laughs> instrument. Now we're just going to wait for everybody to figure it out and mm -hmm. arrive. Uh, they need, they, they're working there too with L2s and NFTs in that space. And they need to continue to develop that out as well. Uh, and that has some very, some very big promise. But along the way, we all then get trapped into, you're right, we get bored, we play with meme coins, or we, we talk about breakouts and technical analysis and all of that other stuff, and we talk about FOMO. Um, FOMO is not going to get anybody really in. Really, if you look at NVIDIA, what the FOMO around NVIDIA is not necessarily the price breakout, but the narrative. I get it. It's going to be the, it's going to be the biggest thing since the internet maybe bigger than the internet. And I saw what the internet did to transformize the US economy and what it did in the early stages for all those internet stocks. I'm in. Whether or not it's breaking out or whatever, I'm in. That's how you got to get people into the crypto space. Not just talking about whether or not we're going to make you get to 100,000 and FOMO in everybody after that in Bitcoin. But what is it? what does it do? What do we do with it? Other than other than custody it and wait for the price to go up, uh, and that is where I think the space is going to have to keep going. It's very close. It is very close to being there, as we mentioned before, right? The UI UX is hundred x better than it was seven years ago. It has to get better for, like you said, my mother, your mother, to you know want to give up their Schwab account and move into this space. But it can, it can get there. Um, you know, it's, it's getting there, but it's got to continue to work towards that. It feels very much like we are, we are six to 12 months away from that. Um, but also that like, it could take a long time. Like we could be perpetually six to 12 months away from that. 
uh, like in a way, if, if that makes sense, because like there, there are, I mean, layer twos are fantastic. We've got this path to on-chain now that we didn't have last cycle, which is kind of the, the coin base and the ego directly to the base chain and the wallet experience is just like fantastic and your apps are there. We just haven't really connected that with, uh, with retail yet. And I, I do wonder if like just fleshing out the, the, the steel man on the bear side a little bit, coming back to this, um, this NASDAQ chart, and we were talking about the internet being, you know, that 1999, 2000, the bubble, all of the, the wildest dreams of the internet eventually came true, but there was this dark period of, of building, at least from an asset price appreciation. A lot of building got done, but the, um, the assets didn't reach uh, highs again for 16 years. I'm not saying we're going to be 16 years in kind of the dark ages with respect to crypto, but it could take a little bit longer than last cycles. It is is a take here. I'm still a believer in the base case four year cycle. You know, just like wait for it. It's going to happen just as it always has. But there's there's a part of me that wonders if it's going to take a bit more time because we have some building to do first before we reach kind of all time highs and and it go back to the moon. What's your take on this? Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and I would also say too that as far as some of the building goes. I think that there needs to be a bit of a, a different mentality about the building. Um, a lot of people in the space kind of, for lack of a better word, take a gaming mentality, right? Let's just get 1.0, 1.0 out there. It's a little bit buggy. It doesn't work right. And we'll kind of fix it with 2.0 and 3.0 and 4.0 and, and eventually we'll get it right. Uh, all right. If, you know, if I'm, if I'm playing World of Warcraft and I get the blue screen of death, there's no big deal. But there's two industries you absolutely cannot do that with. And that is money in healthcare. Hmm. You cannot put out a buggy 1.0 DEX or buggy 1.0 bridge or a buggy 1.0 wallet. We saw that in 22 and 23 with all of the hacks and the money we lost and not understanding, maybe the space didn't understand from the TradFi space, the tremendous reputational damage that that did in that even if like the Solana going down a few months ago. Uh, I went down, you know, for a couple of hours and totally just kind of j- joked about it online on X. <laughs> Understand that people that are looking at the at Solana and thinking about Solana and hear that and see him, it is tremendously damaging to the reputation of it. You cannot go down ever one time, ever. Mm. And if you do, everybody associated with it should be fired. And they should bring in new people and tell them you can never, ever go down. It's just like with healthcare, um, you know, and Theranos, you, you know, you can't, you can't just throw this out there and it doesn't work. People die if you do that. You could do it in the gaming industry. You can do it if you're trying to put up a blog. You can do it in some of those other, because no one dies and no one loses all their money if you screw it up. And so hopefully when the building comes and... We've gone, you correct me here, but we've gone through a pretty long period here now without any major hack problems or any reputational damage in the crypto space recently. We got to keep this up. And, you know, my fear is, is that we get into another mania building phase and then everything kind of goes sideways again. And it just, you know, scares the hell out of people that they don't want to put their money in that space. So this is part of the, understand the space that you're in. You, you know, if you're going to build in this space, you're, you're asking people to put their money in this space. It can never go down. It can never get hacked, ever, not once, ever. And it can never cause a problem for anybody. That's the one thing the TradFi space does for you, is that it promises you it will never go down. It will always be there. And if it does go down through an act of God, they'll make you whole, mm. even though they don't have to. And so that's really where the space has got to really start to think about things. I think that's a great take, Jim. One example I saw earlier this week is um, this company called uh, Exponential, um, which is kind of cool, but they basically are exposing um, different DeFi yield type opportunities, but they're doing it in kind of a, a unique way, which is like they're actually showing you the um, risk adjusted rate of return. So they're they're doing risk profiles. You know, you can get DeFi yield in all these various uh, places, Compound, Aave. But at, you know, I've, 2022, people were getting this in Terra Luna, and it promised you know 18 to 22 percent yield returns. And what terrible user experience when you 
expect to get 20% yield on a stable coin that shouldn't go down, you find out not only did you not get those returns, but all the wealth that you put into this thing dropped to zero. There's an element of this, Jim, where I, I think we have to get better around education, you know, showing investors risk versus reward and, and funneling them into the right place. Like we need some safety rails around this, the type of safety rails that that TradFi has. And that's just going to take some building, honestly. It's going to take market demand and it's going to take some building. But I think you're right. The, uh, the approach to the space has to be different because we've um, crypto builders tend to play pretty fast and loose. Uh, and uh, fairly short-termist. So this might take some time to play out. Jim, I want to get back to uh, inflation as a topic. Okay. So there was this good news on inflation this week. At least I think it was good news. Um, yeah. So inf has inflation cooled? What well, what was the news, by the way? Was was inflation um, was at what, what, like a, a low for the month, like lower than analysts expected it? Yeah, so um, the June Consumer Price Index was reported on January 11th, and it came in as a decline of one-tenth of one percent. It's the first time in four years that the number has actually declined. So what that measure is telling you is that prices from May to June in the entire U.S. economy fell slightly, or if you want to you know, round it, there was basically no price rise. And May was also zero too. So you had two months in a row of zero, of zero and negative a tenth. And that has brought the overall level of CPI measured inflation down to 2.97, round to 3%, which is the lowest it's been this cycle. Now, a year ago, June of 23, it was at 3.05 and now it's at 2.97. Mm. So inflation seems to be moderating in that low 3% range. This has got people thinking that we're finally on that path to that Fed target. The Fed targets inflation at 2%, hmm. that we're going to finally get inflation to go down to 2%, and that's going to allow interest rates to be cut several times. So that's really what happened in, uh, in the inflation numbers, and in that we're hoping that this big rise in prices that we've seen is finally starting to moderate. Now, quick word about that. Since 2020, and I'm using the end of the recession, not necessarily the election, the end of the recession was April, the average price of something in the, U in the U.S. economy is 25% higher. So whatever cost you $100 to buy four years ago, cost you $125 today. Now, the average paycheck in the U.S. economy is up about 18 to 20% over that same period. So if you're an average paycheck... You have to shell out more money today to get the same things you could have gotten four years ago. This is why when you look at presidential approval ratings and, pre and, you know, and polls, they say, what is the number one issue in the economy? Inflation. And they're very mad at the president because they think that inflation is very high. And Axios had a great uh, graphic and they showed the year over year inflation chart where it went up to 9% and back down to three. And they said, this is the way economists look at inflation. It was high and it's coming down. And then they showed the cumulative rise of inflation going like this. And they said, this is how normies look at inflation is that the prices went up a lot and they never really came down again uh, and that they're still paying higher prices. So that's the, that's the rub there. Now, where do I fall down at it? I, warning, I have an unconventional view. I don't think that the inflation rate at 3% is going to go much lower from here. I think that it's going to sort of bottom out, and I've been arguing for years now, it's going to stay in the 3 to 4% range. It's at 3% now, 297. It's at 3% now, the lower end of that range. And I don't think it's going to go much lower than that. That means that all those price gains that we've seen over the last couple of years are going to stick around. That means that the Fed, while we're talking about a September rate cut, is going to find it very difficult to actually get that rate cut done. And once they get that rate cut done, if they do it, to do multiple ones after that. Why do I think that the inflation rate is going to stay sticky? It's supply and demand. There's a giant demand for things in the economy, services, goods, and everything else. Buying them up, keeping the prices elevated. Where is that demand coming from? Two sources. The first, the biggest source is the U.S. government itself. The U.S. economy is $30 trillion. 
that's how much there is in turnover in the economy. You know, uh, us buying stuff and getting paychecks and everything else. Add it all up. It's a $30 trillion economy. Who is one-fifth of that number, 22% to be exact? The federal government. They are six trillion of the tw- of the of the uh, twenty tr- or thirty trillion dollars in the U.S. economy, uh, and so that twenty two percent is one of the highest numbers we have ever seen in American history. The only other times it's been higher was the COVID response when we shut down the economy four years ago in World War II. Typically, what the government does is when we go into recession, the COVID response, they spend a lot of money to stimulate the economy to get it out of recession. Okay, we did that. Then when we recover, they're supposed to stop spending money so that um, they're supposed to stop spending money because the economy can kind of continue on its own. They haven't done that. And that's why we've got these giant budget deficits and we've got all this government spending and that is going to keep prices higher. The second thing is more psychological or ephemeral, and it's it's the mentality of the American consumer. The American consumer is spending more money now. They spend money now. I've heard it being described as PTSD from the shutdowns. It was like a near-death experience. My econ- the economy is going to collapse. My job is going to go away. Well, damn it. I'm just going to take whatever I got left, and I'm going to go to Italy, and I'm going to enjoy myself, and I'm going to buy some stuff, and I'm going to live my life and I'm not going to adhere to those pre-COVID rules that I have to take a certain percent of my paycheck and I got to save it and I got to do some th- some other things. I'm going to enjoy myself. And part of that might also be all the risk taking that you see in financial markets. Well, I ain't going to worry about buying bonds or put my money in a 5% money market fund. I'm going to jump all the way to meme coins is what I'm going to do and hope that I could strike it rich you know, in a meme coin. Well, part of that spending is also keeping prices up as well. So I think that those prices are going to stay higher and the economy is going to stay stronger. Government spending too much money and our mentality is definitely of a spending mode. And that is a post-crisis thing. And when I say spending mode, I'm talking about like the number of units of things we buy because people always say to me, yeah, we're spending more because prices are higher. Yeah, that's true. But we're buying more units of things because we want more things. Um, you know, as an example, if you look at the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, gives you a number on the number of people going through the airports in the United States every day. It is booming to new all-time highs of 3.1 million a day going through the airports this week. So there, you know, and I reason that I bring that up when it comes to spending. The ultimate discretionary item, discretionary meaning you don't have to do it, is to travel. You don't have to do it, but everybody wants to do it. Yet, we all talk about the consumer slowing down. We might be going into recession. If you've been to the airport, the airport has never been more crowded. And most of those people at the airport are doing personal travel. And no one has to do personal travel. But we all want to do personal travel. And whether or not the economy is slowing or whatever, our, you know, uh, how much excess COVID savings we have, we are traveling because it's a different mentality that we have about our spending. And that keeps prices and inflation up as well, too. Well, at this, so this is so prices and inflation will be up. But th- this is another question I, I had for you that I can't get my head wrapped around. Uh, it's just really hard to understand uh, how the U.S. economy is really doing. I think like p- part of this is uh, election year type stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So there's all of these messages. You can't trust, you know, traditional media. So, you know, like there's a certain cohort of the population. It's just really awesome. It's never been better. It's been a great four years. And there's another portion of the population that the, this is a Biden led depression that we're in. And so like <laughs> finding some truth in the middle is, is really difficult. And so there, there's also like, there's a question of where are we now? How is the U.S. economy really doing? You mentioned a lot of confidence in consumer spending, people traveling. You also have high prices. You have U.S. housing is uh, incredibly unaffordable at this point in time. Mm-hmm. This is a this is a chart. This is one of the most unaffordable housing markets in U.S. history. Levels uh, below 100 have only been seen two times in 2006. And then in uh, 1990, so we've got incredibly unaffordable housing, um, you know, and then we have other things like weird unemployment numbers uh, as well, you know, coming out. Here's a tweet. The three month unemployment rate average has risen to 4%. That's 50 um, bips 
above its 12 month low of 3.5 percent, triggering something called uh, Saham rule, I believe. Saham, Saham. Yeah, Saham. Okay, yeah, Saham rule. Saham rule, and according to this, I don't know what Saham rule is. Maybe you could explain it to us. But this has accurately marked the start of every recession since 1950, with only one false positive. So there's a question of where are we in the U.S. economy? Is it doing well? Is it not doing well? And are we getting ready to teeter into recession? Do you have any answers for us? Yeah, I'll give you an answer. I'll give you a thought or a take on it. And it, it, the it, we call it the K-shaped economy. You know, it's the letter K. Part of it's going up and part of it's going down. Um, how do we know which part's going up and which part's going down? The unfortunate reality is it's about it's based on income. So let me give you a disturbing statistic. Bankrate.com, which is a bank, uh, uh, a website that... Um, you know, monitors banks and helps people with uh, their banking, does a survey every year. And they ask people, if in an, if in an emergency, could you come up with $1,000 right away? And two thirds of the American public's answer is no. They wow. cannot come up with $1,000 in an immediate emergency right away. Mm -hmm. They'd have to borrow it from a friend or a family member, or they'd have to max out their credit card or something, but they, they just can't go to the ATM and withdraw $1,000 and say, okay, I need $1,000 because there's X emergency, um, whether it's a health emergency or your air conditioner breaks, here, here's $1,000 and let's go fix it. Two thirds of the country can't do that. And that's very disturbing in that respect. So when you look at the economy with inflation going up and wages not keeping pace, those two thirds of people are really put behind the eight ball. And it really, they, they have to struggle. You know, as I like to say, they shop at Dollar General or Dollar Tree, or they shop at Walmart. And they sit there and they go, well, if I want to buy this because the price has gone up, then I can't buy something else. And they have to make those kind of decisions. The other third of the country is locked up at the airport going to Italy, mm. is buying homes, is enjoying themselves, is revenge spending. And so that's what you're starting to see in this economy. And what is the, now you could argue, hasn't that always been the case? Yes, but the difference is inflation. Inflation really, really hurts the bottom half of the country. And it, it doesn't hurt the top half of the country as much because what doesn't the bottom half of the country also have? They don't have assets. They don't have a portfolio. They don't own crypto. They don't even own a home. They probably rent. Where the top half of the of the country probably has S&P 500 index funds, and they probably have a retirement account, and they probably own their own home, and they see the S&Ps up 18%, and they see while housing is unaffordable, part of the reason that housing is unaffordable is that the, uh, um, the prices are continuing to go up. Well, if you're a homeowner, you're not complaining about prices going up. If you're a home buyer, you're definitely complaining about prices going up. So they're in an okay position. So it's this imposition of inflation. This is why the president's approval rating is so bad, because Jeff Bezos gets one vote and somebody on public assistance gets one vote. And if two thirds of the public can't come up with $1,000 in an emergency, you bet they're going to be very angry about the economy. Mm. And the upper one third might look around and go, looks okay to me, because it is okay for you. But it isn't okay for them until we get the inflation rate down and a lot more. And as I mentioned before, unfortunately, I'm not so sure that we are going to get the inflation rate down. So that that's a great take, by the way, Jim. And it, it's important to get out of whatever bubble that we find ourselves in and, and, and realize that there can be multiple worlds playing out at once. And so- how does this end up? Does this like the does the U.S. economy pivot towards recession? Do you think, or is there a recession already in progress for kind of the 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 low part um, of of the K, and like it's good times ahead for the you know upper part of the K? And like then, how does this all resolve? Because we can't be K shaped forever, can we? No, we can't be K shaped forever. I I would say there's two ways you could pivot this. We could either see maybe I'm wrong and the inflation rate is returning back under 2%, and wages will continue to grow faster than the inflation rate. That's what happened from 2010 to 2020. So you could argue back then from 2010 to 2020, wasn't it sort of K-shaped? Yes. But the difference was those on the bottom end, every year they got a raise. 
that raise at least met inflation. So to use a tennis metaphor, they could hold serve every year. That when they went to Dollar Tree or Walmart, they bought exactly the same amount of stuff as they bought a year or earlier. And the amount that they had to spend to do it, relatively speaking, after their wage increase was the same. They didn't get worse. They just kind of held serve. And then if you, you know, get a raise and improve your lot in life, you could, you could move out of that category. Now they're not. What will get them back into that position is to get the inflation rate down. Now, maybe I'm wrong, and we do have the inflation rate go down quite a bit, and that will, that will go a great way towards resolving that problem um, as well. Otherwise, I think that this problem will, manif- will, will continue to fester for a long time. Let me make a quick word about recession. There was an economist at MIT in the 1970s called Rudy Dornbusch, and he's very influential in Federal Reserve circles. And he had a very famous line that he said, that economic expansions do not die of old age, that they're murdered. Mm -hmm. And what he means by that is, if you look at every recession in the last 50 or 60 years, usually the recession comes about because something like COVID or the housing crash or a war in in um, the Middle East that you know 1990 that causes the price of oil to go up 400 percent in a week, which is what it did in August of 1990, went from 10 to 40 dollars. Um, and those type of things murder the U.S. economy. So, are we going to go into recession? My answer is no. We're not going to go into recession unless you tell me that something is going to happen and murder it. Middle East is going to spike the price of oil, a geopolitical crisis, you know, some kind of a crack up in the financial markets or something, or another pandemic that just shuts down the global economy, or something that we haven't foreseen that comes along. As I like to say, you know, I'm looking at my quote, my Bloomberg for my quotes, and they have these big red headlines. (laughs) And this big red headline comes across the screen, and I go, oh shit, that just changed everything. (laughs) You know, that's what causes a recession, is, is that headline. Now, to be fair, I thought that was about 15 months ago, Silicon Valley Bank fails. I thought, (laughs) man, that might be it. And it turned out that it wasn't. It wasn't it. So that's what causes a recession. Otherwise, what's going to happen is we're going to muddle along. We'll have some slower growth. We'll have some faster growth. But if the inflation rate stays high, then I think what you're going to continue to see, and this might be the, the murder weapon, is more social unrest. Uh, If you really want to see, you know, the the difference in the K-shaped economy where it's really big is in Europe. And And what do we all see all way too often in Europe is demonstrations and tear gas and police and riot gears trying to calm the masses. Look, France just had an election over the weekend and the left won. The left won. And they still burn down Paris, hmm. you know, because they're so unhappy about what's going on in the, in the country right now. So if we don't get that recession or we don't get that um, 2%, then I just think the social divide is just going to continue to grow. Maybe that grows to the point that that is the murder weapon that causes a recession. Uh, but short of that, I don't think that the economy is going to roll over and it's just going to die it does, you know, they don't die, you know, economic expansions don't die of old age. They're murdered. Something has to break it is what it has to be. So as we draw, draw to a close, Jim, one of the questions I was going to ask you is like, what are the upcoming things that could potentially move the markets? And um, it, it seems like part of your answer might be like, we don't know. I mean, we'll know it when we see it, but it'll come out of the blue. It'll be one of those flashing headline types of events. I mean, what do you think about the 2024 election? Uh, could that have the ability to to move markets? Do you think any Fed rate cuts might move markets? Like what sort of catalysts are you just keeping an eye on in the background to, to make a change with your uh, investing strategy and portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. Those can. So if, as far as the 2024 election, I will say this, that up until now, and it's been historic because as we're recording, we don't even... We're not even sure who the Democrat is yeah, going to be running the ballot. No idea. Yeah, we don't even know who, what the name of that Democrat <laughs> is going to be. But yet, if you were to just look at a chart of crypto or the S&P 500 or interest rates and said, so where in this chart do we see when the Democrat is falling off and they're going to have to have complete upheaval at their convention to figure out who it's going to be? 
The answer is you don't see it in those charts. In the end, so it it hasn't been impacting the financial markets to date. I don't think it will until after the election, but there's definitely a lot of issues that are coming that it can impact the economy. One big issue, you know, you uh, you asked me about the SOM rule and about rising unemployment. Mm. There's a counter narrative to that. And the counter narrative is the reason that the unemployment rate is rising is not because the number of jobs is lacking. It's the number of migrants that is coming into the country. Millions of people are coming into the country, literally walking over the Southwest border every day. What is what when they step one foot in this country, what are they? They're unemployed. They don't have a job. Do we have 10 million jobs for largely unskilled, unemployed workers just waiting to be filled? No, we don't. So what we're doing is we're, we're bringing in more and more unemployed people. And when they do the survey of the unemployment rate, they survey households. And they ask, you know, how many people are in the house? How many people are looking for jobs? Well, we're creating more households with unemployed people because they're migrant workers. And that's what's raising the unemployment rate. If that continues, that can be a problem for the economy. That... The unemployment rate is going up not because the number of jobs is disappearing. It's the number of people looking for jobs in this country is swelling because of the mass migration that we've seen. That could be a, a breaking point. The other one that you mentioned, too, is when Rudy Dornbush said that the economy is murdered, one of the big murder weapons, I should have mentioned it earlier, is interest rates, mm. that the Federal Reserve raises rates too high and they break something. Now, that's always a concern. And people have been screaming that the current level is already too high and it could be breaking something or already has broken something. I don't think it has, but maybe it has. But, you know, so watching interest rates um, could be another one as well. But other than that, it's going to be kind of like COVID. You know, it kind of comes out of the blue and breaks the economy. Or before that, the financial crisis. It's going to be something like housing prices. Because I, I was around in 08 and what we were all saying in 08 was, the one thing we can be sure of is home prices never go down because they never, ever have gone down. And so therefore, if you see that they're starting to roll over and go down, don't worry about it. They'll go back up. And then they kind of never did go back up. And it did break the economy into a bad recession. So something like that will happen. But yeah, there's a catalyst that could be coming out of the, out of the election. There's two wars in the world. There's one in the Middle East and there's one with Israel and Gaza. Those could manifest itself into something that could wind up, you know, hurting the global economy. So there's lots of things that can happen along the way that we don't anticipate. But if that doesn't happen, the economy will continue to grow and then it'll grow a little bit slower and it'll grow a little bit faster. And then that K-shape will just continue to widen and widen and widen until we get to something where we try to bring everything back into balance. And a recession is kind of a cleansing event. It helps to rebalance the system. And so that K will just continue to go out of shape. I hate to say it, but a recession is painful, but it also is cleansing and rebalancing and brings everything back in the, in, the, in the focus again. Okay. So then with all of this backdrop, Jim, how should the savvy investor uh, you know, play this, right? We have some potential catalyst that could just kind of come out of the blue. Uh, how, how are you playing this from like what you're allocated in? What does your portfolio look like when it comes to uh, different asset categories uh, that you hold? So cheap commercial, I do run an ETF. Um, and th that ETF is a long only fixed income ETF. So it's a fairly generic kind of ETF. I'm not trying to downgrade my own uh, product. I'm just trying to explain what it is. Mm. Why do I run that kind of ETF is because that's my that's where I've been in the space for 35 years and I'm most comfortable with it. Its symbol is WTBN. It's Wisdom Tree WT. It's a Wisdom Tree ETF, Bianco, Nancy, WTBN. Uh, it's actually been having, in its space, it's been having a very good year so far. So I didn't know I you were doing that, been, Jim. So you launched your own ETF. That's really, really cool. Yeah, it started in December. It started in December. Okay. So it's, you know, it's seven or eight months old um, right now. BiancoAdvisors.com is the website for my ETF. You could read all about it or just ask me any questions about it as well. And WTBN is the symbol. I am running that portfolio thinking that we are in a position of higher, that's the website right there. Um, and that's my latest quarterly letter right there that where I explain our current positioning, mm. that video that you're looking at on the screen. Um, uh, I am currently positioned longer term over the next several years, thinking that we are going to be in a, in a period of 
stable to higher interest rates. And that in that period of stable to higher interest rates, there's, there's a lot of opportunity in the bond market. Even though prices will be going down, there's big coupons in the bond market to get a five or five-ish percent return on a coupon level and try and hold on to that by not losing on prices. Uh, so I think that the first thing I would say to people at this stage of the game is your expectations for what should happen in the future should be dialed back quite a bit because there's two opportunities that you have in the market. You have the traditional market, let's call that the S&P 493, which is not the Magnificent Seven AI stocks, and the bond market. I think that in a blended period, you should be looking at about 6 or 7% a year out of that. Um, a little bit less in the bond market with more stability, a little bit more out of equities with a little bit more volatility. After that, there's another group. There's the seven AI stocks. There's other things like crypto. You could make orders of magnitude in those markets, you know, double, triple, quadruple your money, but you could also wind up seeing 70 or 80% of it being drawn down. Mm -hmm. You've been in crypto space a long time. I've been in crypto space a long time. How many times have we seen 70 or 80% uh, drawdowns in this happen. market? Yeah. So you don't want to have your lifestyle de dependent on not having a 70% drawdown in crypto. If you're, you know, if you're so into crypto that if the prices fell 70%, you got to sell your house or you got to change your lifestyle, you don't want to be there. You just don't want to be there right now. So yeah, you want to have some portion to that, especially if you're younger. The last thing I'll give you as an idea is I always talk about bear markets as being about time, not about price. So let's say the stock market peaks and it has a bear market. All right. It will be a number of years before the stock market makes a new high. If you're 65 years old, your life expectancy is 20 more years to 85, let's say. That's the life expectancy. You don't have 10 years to, you don't want to wait 10 years for the stock market to get back to its old highs. That's half your life expectancy. If you're 35 and there's a bear market in stocks, keep waving them in all the way on down. Because if it takes 10 years for that bear market to, to, to run its course and you're 45, you got another 40 years and another couple more cycles that the stock market can keep going up. So a lot of it is dependent upon where you are in that age bracket. My fund is probably more structured towards older people that are looking for higher, you know, more safety kind of income uh, ideas. But that's where all the money is, too. That's why I decided to do that kind of fund, because the boomers still own a majority. A boomer is anybody over the age of 60 at this mm. point. And it, it, they still own and a majority And they need something like this, the, basically, don't they? Yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I'll get it. If you're Gen Z or a younger millennial, you, you can look at my fund and go, well, why would you <laughs> want to own something like that? Well, it might make sense in a smaller proportion for you. Sure but you might want to take more risk because you've got decades of investing left, whereas boomers have a decade or two of investing left in, in the marketplace. What about you personally, yeah. Jim? What do you do on the kind of like, uh, you know, are you doing anything in crypto? Do you hold any crypto assets? What, what, what's that portfolio I, I've owned, like? I've, hold, I've held crypto assets for several years. I continue to hold crypto assets for several years. Uh, I will um, always hold them. Um, as well. I first got into Bitcoin in 2017. Um, I got into Ethereum in 2018. Um, and then I got into, I got into DeFi. Most of my, most of my um, Ethereum-based assets are either in Aave vaults or they're in um, uh, Uniswap pools. Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, they're locked away and I'm you know, I'm going to do the Warren Buffett thing. I'm going to check them again in five years right. uh, and see and see and see where <laughs> they're going to go. I am in the stock market. I own real estate. You know, I'm in my own fund. Mm. Um, so I'm in a, in a, in a lot of in a lot of different places all, along the way. Yeah, uh, that uh, that's a great place to be, uh, Jim. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you know, conversations with you always just help me make sense of what's going on in macro. And uh, I think you answered a lot of questions that were top of mind for me today. So we definitely appreciate you. And you are going to be at, uh, so Dave is not on this podcast because he's away at ETCC 
and uh, you like couldn't make it. The next time I think I will probably see David and yourself will be at the Permissionless Conference that's coming in October and you're speaking there, correct? That is correct. I will be, um, um, uh, I think I'm going to be on a panel as it, as it stands right now with uh, Bel Kunis and uh, James Seifert talking oh, about ETFs. Oh, are you going to be arguing about ETFs or what's that? Those yeah, I think I'm going to be... I'm going to be the antagonist uh, <laughs> uh, 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 on on that panel, and I, I look forward to it. I lo- I know both those guys are very good guys, uh, and it should be an interesting conversation. Oh, I can't wait to see you there, Jim. We'll uh, we'll talk in person for sure. Uh, so we will end it there, Bankless Nation. Thank you so much. As you know, none of this has been financial advice. You know that uh, crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier, not for everyone. But we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. 